ask you to go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book that mandates the man to brew the coffee. I said to those who were present this morning, for those who join us tonight, for the first time, so welcome, so good to see each and every one of us and of you. And this the theme for this three-part series is it's time for action. You and I need to get off our blessed assurance. It is time for action. Would you please stand with me for the reading of the Word of God? Hebrews chapter 4. And from verse 1. I'm reading from the New King James Bible. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said, you may be seated. Our text tonight is Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2. And I, I pray that you, will pr pr that you will really pay close attention to what the, the writer of the book of Hebrews wrote to us. He said, for indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them but the word which they heard did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those who heard it and i want to title this message mix it mix it Mix it. If you've ever baked the cake, you will know there's no way that you can simply take the ingredients and throw them in a pan, put it in the oven and think you're going to get a cake. You have to mix the ingredients. Oh, they don't bake in Lady Smith. I forgot. They only buy so they hardly know what I'm talking about. But I want you to think about a church. Remember what I said this morning. I have not come across no person who confessed Jesus Christ to be his or her personal Lord and Savior that does not want to be known as a person of faith. I have now been serving God for just a little over 40 years. And I can honestly tell you, I've never come across a person confessing Jesus Christ to be his or her personal Lord and Savior that came up to me and said, I just want you to know I'm not a person of faith. I once had a man come to me and said, my name is Mr. Worry." I worry for everything. And his pastor stood next to him and he said, if you don't want to believe me, ask my pastor. He will confirm what I'm telling you. I am Mr. Worry. But I've never had nobody ever come to me and say, I'm Mr. or Mrs. Unbelief. We all want to be known as people of faith. Now the, the author of the book of Hebrews writes he said the same gospel that has been preached to us have been preached to them the word gospel for those of you who do not know means good news so we have all heard the same good news it benefited us 
Because what we have heard, we have mixed it with faith, but it didn't benefit them one bit because what they heard, they have never mixed it with faith. I told you this morning as I was waiting upon the Lord towards the beginning of last year and I asked God just to reveal His heart to me pertaining to what He wanted me to focus on. And I shared with you, God spoke to my heart, the revival of the Word. Now I want you to think about this. Now for those of you who sometimes have the opportunity to minister the Word of God to this congregation, or wherever you might go, I've got bad news for you. I don't know if you will be able to deal with this bad news, but I've got scripture to prove it. 75% of the people in any service never benefit from the word. Only 25% of people in any given service benefit from what they hear because they mix it with faith the other 75 percent will amen which means so be it they might even say hallelujah which means praise the lord they might even become like an american get so overwhelming excited that they start to run the aisles but at the end of the day what they have heard does not benefit them one bit because they don't mix what they have heard with faith. And so the first message that God impressed on my heart, I titled in that series, What Do You Do With the Word? that you receive in the book of Isaiah chapter 55 God through the prophet Isaiah turn your Bibles there with me please let your fingers do the walking through the Bible Isaiah chapter 55 very well known passage of scripture God speaks to the people of Israel and even to you and I through the prophet. Now, Isaiah chapter 55, let me just quickly tell you, is not a logos word, which means a written word. It is a rhema word. It is a prophetic word. But listen very carefully. Isaiah 55 from verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and snow from heaven, and do not, do what? Return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Now if that is then true, that God's word will not return void, it will accomplish, it will bring about that which He has said for your and my benefit and for His glory. Question, why does so many of our lives never change? Because God can't lie. Why doesn't our lives change for the better? 
Why doesn't our circumstances change for the better? I have known people that have been struggling financially for years. And they're still struggling. I have known people that have been living in poverty for years. And they still live in poverty. Yet they have heard the word. I have known people that have been enslaved to sin, irrespective of what, for years, and they still enslaved to that same sin today. For example, I've, been, I've known people cheering for the Blue Bulls for years, and they still do. I mean, I just can't. God help them. Why? Then if God said, My word would not return void unto me, it shall accomplish that which I send it forth. How come so many people's lives don't change? Could it just be because we all sit in the same service? We listen to the same sermon. Hello? Now, I know some of y'all find it sometimes very difficult because, you know, to, to stay for the whole sermon because you go on meditation. But how come we listen to the same word and then you only have 25% who receive the word and their circumstances change, their life changes for the better. But 75% life never change. Could it just be because what we have heard, we never mix it with faith. Hello, am I just preaching to myself? Let me, let me explain to you and then ask you a question. Now, there's 52 Sundays in a year. Would you agree with me? Or do you need a calculator? 52 Sundays a year. This is one of the few churches that still have Sunday morning and Sunday evening. And it was heartbreaking to me to hear today that people don't support Sunday night anymore. Do you know why you don't support it? Because you don't value it. Because if you had valued it, you would have been here on Sunday evenings. If you would value the home groups or the cell group, you will be part of one. But irrespective, let's say you decided you will only attend Sunday morning. You're not going to come back Sunday night? Because that's too much church for you. And let's say you only attended 40 Sundays. That means you have heard 40 different sermons. Now, without looking at your notebooks, close your notebooks for a moment. Close your Bibles for a moment. Forty sermons. Give me the passage of Scripture of one of those forty sermons. Give me the text that was preached from Give me the title and just share a little bit of the content. You don't even have to do the whole sermon. Just a little bit of the content and how it's changed your life. Now let me tell you, you're not the exception to the rule. I've, come, I've asked this question in many places 
and they will be very quick to grab their notebooks and those things. I said, close them. Because it's one thing, and I will always encourage it. Take notes of the sermon. But it's no use taking notes of the sermon and go home and put your notebook on the shelf and not working through it again. Hello. But this group of people is not the exception to the rule. I have not come across one congregation where I've posed these questions, where one person could stand up and say, I can give you the scripture reading, this text, the title, share with you some of the content and how it's changed my life. And I understand why a man like Juan Carlos Ortiz when he came to the revelation of discipleship, decided, I'm only preaching five sermons for the whole year. He said, he only preaches five sermons because you do not have enough time. You have not even worked through the first one and boom, here comes the next one already. You have not had the time to take that which you have heard and mix it with faith, meaning to apply it to your life, apply it to your circumstances, and boom, here comes the next sermon already. We have heard, had so much of preaching. In Afrikaans they say, Ons is dier preek. But yet it doesn't change our lives. You see, my brother and sister in Christ, if you and I are going to be a person of action, living the life of faith that is pleasing unto God, bringing about the results and bearing the fruits, that will glorify His name. That which you and I hear, you have to apply it. You have to mix it with faith. Otherwise, it doesn't benefit you. You have to mix it. They all heard the same gospel. They all heard the same message preached to them or at them. But yet, they didn't benefit from it. Only a handful benefit. The majority don't because what they hear, they never mix it with faith. What does it mean to mix what I hear with faith? You have to act upon it. Or whether it makes sense or not, you have to act upon it. And I want us to look at a few examples where people have heard a word that didn't make sense, but yet they acted upon it and see how it saved a whole nation See how it's changed their own circumstances. Remember, your and my opinion doesn't count when it gets to the Word of God. If the Bible says it's blue, it's blue. If it says it's red, it's red. If it says smile, it says smile, not laugh. Hello? Well, I think. Stop thinking and start acting. Stop thinking and start acting. Stop reasoning. Start act. Well, it doesn't make sense. Therefore, the more you need to act, you need to mix it. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. 
Are you there? Say amen. Don't say amen if you're not there because then you're lying. In Exodus chapter 14, we read about how God has led the Israelites out of Egypt. And now they come to a place where they pitch up camp. Let's read from verse 10. You can go and read the whole Exodus 14, but let's just read from verse, from verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel did what? They cried to the Lord, meaning they started to pray. Okay. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? So first, when fear entered into their lives, the first thing they did, they started to cry unto the Lord. They started to pray. The next thing they did, they started to accuse. Now, thank God it doesn't happen here in Lady Smith, just there in Bloemfontein. Now watch this. Verse 12. Is it not the word that we told you in Egypt saying... Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people to go into their tents. I'm just reading from the Pentecostal Bible. No, tell the people to move where? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Forward. Faith will never take you backwards. Faith will always take you forward. For those of you taking notes, faith is not faith unless subjected to a test. Faith is not faith unless being subjected to a test. Obedience is not obedience unless subjected to a test faith is the key whereby you enter into the arena of the supernatural faith is the power by which the things you desire become the things you possess faith is not faith unless subjected to a test. Obedience is not obedience unless subjected to a test. Faith is the key whereby you enter into the arena of the supernatural because God just works in the supernatural. But whatever He does in the supernatural manifests in the natural. Faith is the power by which the things you desire becomes the things you possess. So here they come. The Bible is not clear how long they have been enslaved by the Egyptians. We do know that they have been in Egypt for 430 years, but the Bible is not clear on how many of that 430 years they were enslaved. But irrespective, the, 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 the English Bible reads, they left with boldness. Some of the translation says, God delivered them with his mighty hand. One moment, they are the poorest of poor on the face of the earth. And within 24 hours, God did not just change their life dramatically from bringing them out and out of bondage, out of slavery, and bringing them into freedom. He made them the most wealthiest people on the face of the earth. But when the first 
test came. Remember what I said. Your mind needs to be renewed because if your mind is not in line with the mind of God, you can never speak the thoughts of God. That's why it's so important to read the Word of God. That's why it's so important to read the Word of God so your mind can be renewed. So you think as God thinks. If you think as God thinks, you can speak as God speaks. So here comes the first test. Two things happened immediately. First, they became fearful. Secondly, they started to blame. But somewhere in between, they found the time to pray. And Moses was praying too. And so God comes to Moses and says, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people to move forward. Hey, God, just in case you didn't notice, that sea is still closed. Do you think it made sense to Moses when God instructed him to tell the people to move? No. But unless he mixed with faith that which he heard and do what God instructed, guess what? They would have either died there or they would have gone back to Egypt. And so, thank God, Moses chose the right thing. He said, I heard what you said. It doesn't make sense to me, but I'm going to mix it with faith. And I'm going to obey your word. And it was not until Moses obeyed that he passed the test and the Red Sea opened. Now, if you would go to God, first and foremost, if you go to Moses and you would ask Moses, who opened the Red Sea? What do you think he would answer you? He would say to you and I, God opened the Red Sea. But if you had gone to God and said, God, who opened the Red Sea? What do you think God would have said? He would have said, I could not do it without Moses. God cannot change your and my circumstances unless we do not work along with Him. Hello? God cannot change your and my life. God cannot change our circumstances unless we work along with Him. Although the word that we hear does not make sense. So you mix it with faith. What do I mean? I start to act upon a word that doesn't make sense. And the moment I act, He who spoke the word comes on the scene and does exactly what he had promised he will do. Oh, I know. It's wonderful to amen. I remember I did a revival in Oklahoma City many years ago. The Sunday morning, we were about 200 in service of which at least 150 of those people either lived in the parks or under the bridges. But they were so hungry for God that we had to extend the meetings. And the Friday night, there was a man, and if I would say something, he would say, preach it, brother, preach it. And sometimes he will say, good preaching. And sometimes he will say, hallelujah and amen. And eventually, I said to him, my brother, all the hallelujahs and amen mean nothing unless you do not apply the word. Well, he got mad and left. I, I passed it in Mpangeni. Leon Khusen's sister was my treasurer. 
Isabel and uh, Isabel said this to me one day. She said, Pastor, you are helping people to help themselves and they don't like it. Because they want you to do it for them. Hello? You can say, ouch. You see, I can't do it for you. What you hear, what you understand, what you receive, I can't mix it with faith for you. Only you can do it. And so, God opened the Red Sea, but He worked with Moses. He couldn't do it without Moses. If Moses kept praying, that's why God asked him, He said, why do you cry to me? This is not a time for prayer. This is a time to, for action. This is a time to take that which you have heard, mix it with faith, because I said, my word will not return unto me void. I said, I'm going to take you to a land of milk and honey, where you will live in houses you have not built. You will eat from fruit trees you have not planted. Does it look like there's any houses here? Does it look like there's any fruit trees here? No, then get your, your butt in action and move. Because there's no fruit trees here. I have spoken. And you see, unfortunately, so many a time, we want to pray. We want to pray. Oh, we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. Yes, yes we do. But there's a time for prayer and there's a time for action. I never attended the first It's Time in 2017 in Bloemfontein for my own personal reasons. But I believe they said there was a million people. Whether there was or not is irrelevant. But they had the opportunity to meet with a group of pastors. I think it was maybe two years thereafter. And so in this meeting, I was listening to the discussions they had. And I said, I have a question. Now, if you hang around me long enough, you'll come to find I ask a lot of questions. Because I've just simply learned from the Japanese. If you ask a question, you're stupid for a few seconds. You never ask a question, you're stupid for the rest of your life. So I asked him, I said, listen, in 2017, Angus Buchan was here. It was the first its time of its kind. They say there were approximately a million plus people. Whether there was a million, it doesn't matter, that's irrelevant. Can I simply ask you, what have you done since then? Nothing. So you all got excited while its time was going on. Because you get drawn into the atmosphere that has been created by that event. But then thereafter, when the responsibility of action fell on your shoulders, nothing. Nothing. I came back to South Africa and God told me when he, he actually took my spirit out of my body while I was in the United States and he brought me to the red light at in, 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 in Curilon in, in Bloemfont and I was standing at the red light. I had the, the cape on my back. God cares for you and I had the cross in front of me and I said, God told me, go tell the people in South Africa, I have not forgotten about them, there's hope. But the hope will only become relevant and manifest through the church. I can't tell you how many places I preach that message. And people will get overwhelming, excited, believing it. Then I go back next year and I ask him, what have you done? Nothing. They did not benefit. They all heard the same message. 
but they didn't benefit from it. And the reason why they did not benefit from it, oh, they just wanted to pray. While God said, move. You see, you have to discern between when do I need to stand still and pray and when do I need to move. Let's give me another example. Go to Genesis chapter 26. Are you okay out there? Because I'm so enjoying myself. Genesis chapter 26 is Isaac. Verse 1. There was a famine in the land. Beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. Hello, God. Just in case you didn't notice, there's a famine. And now you tell me, not to follow in the footsteps of my father and go to Egypt. Yet you know I can get a meal in Egypt. Yet you know whatever I need for my family is available in Egypt. But you tell me not to go there. Do you think it made sense to him? No. But he obeyed the word of God. And then in the midst of a famine, in the midst of a drought, Isaac starts to plow. Now I live in the free state. There's a benefit living in the free state, but it's also a disadvantage living in the free state. The benefit of living in the free state, you can see all the way to your retirement day. The disadvantage of living in the free state, you know how long your retirement is going to last. But when they start to plow those fields, and that wind starts to pick up, and it blows that red dusk, day turns into night. This man plows in a drought. There's a famine. I think... These guys looked at him, and who knows, maybe they said to themselves, something is wrong with Isaac. He lost his mind. He's got sunstroke. Some, doesn't he know it's a drought? But Isaac had a word from God. That did not make sense. You stay. So often we want to run away to Egypt. Because Egypt can give me a better life. I can get a better job in Egypt. All these things. And God said, stay. And so he plowed in the midst of a drought. And look what happened in verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. Not thirtyfold, not sixtyfold, a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. Now listen to verse 13. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Simple, plain Afrikaans or English. So the man, listen very carefully. The man began to be rich. And he continued getting more rich until he became very rich. That's the right translation. You, you see, 
If you act on the word, it doesn't make sense. If you act on the word, how do you do it? You mix it with faith. How do I mix it with faith? You act. God, it doesn't make sense. I don't understand. Why would you tell me in the midst of the drought, stay put? Yet, you know, just just on the other side of the fence, everything I need is available. But yet you say, stay. And so he mixed that word with faith. Those who were there with him, like I said, they most probably looked at him and said, you, this guy's gone insane. <laughs> I remember when I came into pastoring in Impangini and I told them, I said, listen guys, I want you to put this in the minutes. I said, I, I haven't made this debt. And I know some of y'all haven't made it as well. We inherited this debt. But I want you to put it in the minutes. From this day on, we work on a cash basis only. I don't make debt. So if the air conditioner is out, don't come and ask me, can we not take a loan? I said, you're going to trust God with me for it. Or we're going to go without air conditioner. Although we did not have air conditioners, we had fans. I'm just using it as an example. And so I started to sow finances outside of the church. Other than the administrative tithes. In other words, the tithe of the tithe that had to go to head office. I started to sow over and above that outside in the community. And some of you are going to be shocked in what I'm just about to say. I sometimes sowed into the life of non-believers. Because you see, they're not my harvest. They're simply my soil. And so the council came to me and the council asked me, are you going to take off this little we have and give away? I said, I don't give away anything in life. Nothing. My thoughts are seed. My words are seed. My attitude are seed. My actions are seed. And a seed that leaves my hand never leaves my life. It simply goes into my future. So if you sow wrong words, they go into your future. If you sow wrong attitude, it goes into your future. And so I remember when we had to replace the sound system because we just had a little nitty bitty one and I told them now remember I told you I don't make debt I had a guy come from Durban I said please come and have a look at the sanctuary tell us what will work for us and blah 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 and so this guy came and he said back then you don't need more than I think eight or ten ten channel soundboard and and this is the kind of speakers. And I said, give me a price. And he gave me a price. And I mixed the word with faith. And I put that sound system cash. We had two pastors that we supported every month. Every month they came by. <laughs> every month. To come and collect their checks. I never looked at what the bank balance said. Because I had gone by the bank balance. Can I give you a cup of tea, sir? But there's no check for you. But every month, I gave, we gave them their checks. When I left Mpangeni after 10 years, I had no debt. Just general expenses and a very strong bank account. God said, stay here. How many times have you and I sat and we have listened to the Word of God? But it hasn't changed our life, hasn't changed our circumstances. Does that mean God is a liar? Is God at fault? No. But God can only honor His Word the moment you and I mix it with faith. In other words, we act upon something that doesn't even make sense.
Let's go to First Kings. I just want to give you a couple of examples so that you can understand what it means. First Kings chapter 17. Another drought. Looks like there was a lot of droughts in the Bible. Elijah and a widow. Verse 8. Are you there? Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Take note, this widow was not a Jew. So God is sending him to someone that is not a Jew. God, you know, it would have made sense if if you're going to send me to a widow, at least send me to a Jew. But she's not a Jew. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, she was, immediately she turned Pentecostal. Immediately. So she said, as sure as the Lord your God lives, I can't. I only have a handful of meal and a little bit of oil. Doesn't that sound like Pentecostal people? (laughs) If you don't want to show me thieves, show me some gums, but show me something. The word that was spoken to her did not make sense. So she immediately started to make excuses why she could not heed to the word. Now listen to what Elijah said to her. Ten, verse 10, so he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake first and bring it to me and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of your flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of your oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did not do what Elijah said. I'm just reading from the Pentecostal Bible. No. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and a household ate for many days. What did she do? That which she had heard, which didn't make sense, she mixed it with faith. She acted upon that word. You know, I don't know. Who knows? You know, maybe she had thought for a moment when she told him, I am with child. Maybe she thought, okay, maybe he will tell me, don't worry about it. But Elijah had a word from God. He said, go to Zarephath. There I've commanded the widow. So he mixed the word with faith. He acts upon it. He comes to the gate. I don't know how he knew. I assume the Holy Spirit pointed and said, that's the word. He said, "Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Widow, you just don't know it yet, but God has appointed you to take care of me, so go get me some water and bake me some bread. (laughs) She, what she heard, she mixed it with faith. 
what happens? They ate for many days. Why isn't our lives changing? I read a book, and I'm not going to tell you by who, because this guy gets severely attacked by people. And this is a statement he made. He said, Christianity runs a mile wild, but an inch deep. More so in the Pentecostal and in the charismatic churches than any other churches. We can get excited. We can amen. We can shout. We can run. But our lives, our circumstances don't change. We all hear the same message. Can I give you one more example and then we're going to close. Is that okay with you guys? Well, even if it wasn't, I'm still going to do it. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. Again, I can give you so many examples from the Word of God. 2 Kings chapter 4 from verse 1. This time it's Elisha and a widow. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I will share it with them. 2 Kings chapter 4. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets. 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Listen to the instructions. He's very clear about what she has to do. First, go and borrow the empty vessels. Then you take that empty vessels, you and your son, you go into a room and you close the door behind you. If you don't close the door, what I'm about to say will not come to pass. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set it aside the full ones. When must she start to pour? After the door is closed. You see, sometimes in, you receive a prophetic word. But you don't listen to the conditions. I remember in 1986 when God spoke over my life prophetically through a lady by the name of Charlotte Cronker. And God confirmed the call on my life. It, the instructions was very clear. Don't run and start your own church. This is a time of preparation. Submit to the leadership. Oh, but we just listen, we just hear this part, and then off we run and do our own thing. Hello? So Elisha speaks to her a word, a rhema word, that doesn't make sense. Go and borrow empty, all that I have is a jar of oil. I don't know it, how much bigger it was than this. Go and borrow empty vessels, then come into the room, close the door, and then start to pour. Don't start to pour until the door is closed. Listen to the instructions. And so when she mixed the word which she had heard with faith, in other words, she acted first thing, she sent her son, says, go and borrow empty vessels. Then they brought the empty vessels into the room, then they closed the door. And once they closed, now they started to pour. And that oil never stopped until the last empty vessel was full. And you can go and read. She went back to Elisha and said, there's no more empty vessels. And this is what he said to her. 
Now go and sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons live. I love that word. Not survive. Live. There's a difference between surviving. So many children of God just living a life of surviving. While he wants you to have a life of living, a life of abundance. I remember when I I was pastoring in Pangani and I realized God was leading me in a different direction, in the direction that I have been now for, I don't know how many years, traveling the world. I had so much of security, Chris, in that church. They so took care of us. They, they were really the widow of First Kings chapter 17. They took care of us in every aspect. So I had this security. But my spiritual father, Pastor Henry Boyens, I remember him and I had a conversation. And he told me, he said, Johan, my biggest challenge, because he resigned from Standerton, he said, my biggest challenge was never to trust God. Because God had always been faithful. The word faithful means deep sense of responsibility. He said, my biggest challenge was to trust myself to trust God to meet my every need. And so when I sensed God was changing direction, He was leading, I was wrestling with myself. I don't think, to be honest with you, I don't think I had a hundred rand in my bank account. And now God wants me to put my foot out of the boat, not knowing where my next plate of food was going to come from, how I was going to pay rent or any of those things. And I sat in my study in Mpangini, wrestling with God. But I knew I had a word from God. So God was all quiet because he had already spoken. He was waiting on me. And all of a sudden, I don't know, I believe it was the Holy Spirit quickened those words to my spirit. My biggest challenge was never to trust God because God had always shown himself to be faithful. My biggest challenge was to trust myself. And I said, God, today you hunt shoes to trust himself to trust you. And I mixed that word with faith. And I called the church. I said, I want everybody to be there on Sunday morning. I have an announcement to make. I'm resigning. It's now been, I don't know how many years. And although it's true that some places we have not been treated well. For most places we have. I can honestly tell you, I've never went to bed one night hungry. I've never been stuck on the side of the road not having money to put petrol in my car. I have never had to go to Anarin and say, Anarin, I'm sorry. I don't know what we're going to do this month. We're going to have to trust God to move on our behalf. You know, maybe, uh, maybe help in the hunt will bring us a bag of groceries. Nothing of that ever. So this day, we continue to be a channel of God's blessings. Because we mixed it with faith. You have to act. You have to act. You can quote the word of God as much as you like. It sounds so spiritual. But show me how it's changed your life. Let me close. They all heard the same gospel that we heard. But it didn't benefit them because they didn't mix it with faith. And I said, 75% of seed that is sown in any given service goes lost. Only 25% bear fruit. And I have scripture to back it up. In Matthew chapter 13 and in Mark chapter 4, Jesus tells us the parable of the sower. And 
And if you go and read the parable of the sower, you will find he makes four different references of the kind of people who heard the word. But here is the interesting thing. Of the 25% who had received the word and have mixed it with faith. Are you ready for this? Only 33 and a third percent bear a hundredfold. 33 and a third bear 30 fold. 33 and a third bear 60 fold. But only 30% of the 25% bear a hundredfold. But yet, we want to call ourselves people of faith. I'm going to repeat myself because repetition brings revelation, church. If you and I are a man or a woman of faith, there has to be fruit to confirm it. There has to be fruit to confirm it. Otherwise, nobody will ever believe you and I. Never. They will never believe us. Show us. Show us. And when I was in Nigeria in the year 2000, excuse me, at the Synagogue Church of All Nations, T.B. Joshua, we sat, myself, my brother, and a number of us sat there around the table, and we were making conversation with some of T.B. Joshua's uh, disciples. And they said something that we could not understand. They said they were still waiting to be born again. Now that was a strange thing for us. And so we asked them, we said, how can you call yourself a disciple? But at that moment, I did not realize they were not calling themselves disciples of Jesus Christ. They were calling themselves disciples of T.B. Joshua. You see, it's even in the Bible, John the Baptist had his own disciples. But irrespective, so they asked us, they said, are you born again? And of course, we all said, yes. They said, prove it. Would you mind opening your Bibles at Mark chapter 16? Say it again. <laughs> Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, and listen very carefully. This is not Mark speaking. This is Jesus, the second person of the Godhead himself speaking. This is God. Let's read from verse 14, Mark chapter 16, verse... Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. That word hardness means their lack of understanding. Because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow who? Those who believe. What signs? And then he numbers the signs. He mentions them. Listen very carefully. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name they will cast out the demons when last did you cast out the demon oh you didn't think white people do get demons huh? in my name they will cast out demons they will speak with new tongues they will take up serpents and if they drink anything deadly it will by no means they will lay the hands on the sick and they shall recover. When last did you lay your hand on sick and they recovered?
Don't, don't get mad at me. That's the word. That's the word. So for those who believe, the moment you give your heart and life to God by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, there has to be signs. You see, but we have become great followers of signs. You have an evangelist come here, and there's uh, manifestations of all different kinds of miracles. Tomorrow night, this place will be full. You know why? Because we will all go out there and say, Oh, you know what? We have this great event. You know, last night, somebody got out of the wheelchair and blah. And tomorrow night, this place will be packed by sign followers. What signs are following you and me? Church, it's time for action. <laughs> and the foundation of your and my action is faith. So the next time, I trust that when you listen to the word of God, you will apply it. Because it's when you mix it, that's the application, you do it. God, I don't know how these things work. But it's okay, God, I'm going to do it. And see how your life change. See how your circumstances change. But unfortunately, your leadership cannot do it for you. As much as Anarin loves me and I love her, she can't do it for me. I can't do it for her. You have to take that which you heard, mix it with faith, in other words, act. Then it will benefit you. And when it benefits you, guess what comes? Here comes a testimony. Here comes a testimony. That you can come and share with the body of believers for their edification and upliftment. But it's always for the glory of God. Always. Everything God does is for your and my benefit, but it's always for His glory. So what are you doing with the word that you receive? It didn't benefit them because they didn't mix it with faith. Amen and amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Right there where you are seated, come on, start to speak with God. Speak with God. Lord, as we stand before you tonight, who knows our heart better than you, God? You know that we can talk the walk. But how many times we lack of walking the talk? God, our, our lives don't change. Our circumstances don't change. People stay enslaved to sin. And all these kind of things, their finances doesn't change. Because that which they have heard, they don't mix it with faith. So tonight I'm asking you, God, please, God, forgive us. And Lord, I know you have our best interest at heart. But just like we cannot do it for one another, God, likewise, you can't do it for us. You cannot as much as you love us, God. You say, it's all up to you. It's all up to you. If you take that which you have heard, you have mixed it with faith. In other words, you act upon it. You will reap the benefit from it. So God, would you please, 
Would you please help us to remember the word that we hear? And Holy Spirit, sometimes we just don't know how to act upon it. Well, will you come and grant us the wisdom how to act? In Jesus' name. Now look at me, please. Anybody needs prayer here tonight, I want you to come right away. You see, I didn't ask you to raise your hand. I said, come right away. If you need prayer, it doesn't matter for what. Come. Maybe you have a sickness or infirmity in your body. Come right now. Because I want you to these all the people Jesus said and for those who believe now you have heard now you need to mix it with faith in other words you need to act can I pray for all these people yes I can but I'm not going to I need you to come not you, Pastor. Not you, Pastor. Take the oil. Come on now. Ni any kubas. Take the oil. Stand in front of a person. Ask them. What can I pray for? And I'm bitten in so hard that I'm all along you can wear me. You worry? You see, this is what it means in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 11 says, And he, that's Christ, gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, pastors, to equip the saints. That means. What I'm doing right now, I have taught you the word. Now I'm equipping you. Now I'm allowing you to put it into action. Come on. Come. He's not him on that house. He's a man. He's a he's a booty iso. He's a booty iso. Hallelujah. Lord. 